Um, so first, it's great that so many people have come. <laughs> this is kind of a nice topic, and I will not go into much depth. Uh, this talk is more about uh, why it's so difficult for us to develop uh, something for the Raspberry Pi. Some of that information is specific to the Raspberry Pi and to the ecosystem and uh, yes, all the specific stuff. Uh, some of them would uh, apply to any embedded platform. So let's get started. First, the agenda. I will be talking about, well, most importantly, the business model. Uh, then a few words about how we do things differently regarding booting, kernel, user space, and installation. Good. So let's start with the, with the business model. Um, the Raspberry Pi is closed by intention. However much the foundation may claim that they are open source, open, 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 whatever, uh, they are closed by intention because um, they use brand marketing with secrecy, mystery, and myth. There is a bit, the, 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 just imagine how a new Raspberry Pi model appears on the market. It's some rumors, then on one day it appears, yeah, like, okay, so originally no one may talk about it, like, uh, Definitely not about the, the release dates or something like that. And then on one day they, they appear and everyone wants them because everyone's curious what's, what's inside. Um, I even suspect them that the missing documentation may be part of the plan because if you don't have full documentation, then uh, some features may be unlocked with a firmware update or just yeah, because it leaks. I don't know, maybe that's, uh, that's uh, thinking too much behind the corner, but uh, you know, like, the, the, the thing is, uh, since we don't know what is exactly inside, uh, you can get surprises, and those surprises sometimes may be even pleasant. Um, right, but now if you look at that from this uh, vendor perspective, like being a hardware vendor. The hardware alone is useless. Um, means when, if, if you want to sell some hardware like the Raspberry Pi, you will not be able to sell it without any software on it because it's, it's, it's meant for, for hobbyists, not for developers who will yeah, try to develop a bootloader and a kernel and drivers and whatever because that would take time. No, they want to sell on day one. So you need some software on day one. Um, now, since you do, um, you can't really develop the stock software in public because if you, if you started developing drivers in public, everyone would get an idea what the new model will contain. Yeah? So you would destroy that, that mystery and myth around it. In other words, they have to be closed. And they have to start developing behind a closed door. Um, now, they have little motivation to change. Because the Raspberry Pi is a successful business. Uh, the, the Pi 4 sells like hotcakes. In many geographies, it was sold out. Like, you could not even order it, it said like, yeah, the next, it, when you tried in early July, it said like the net, next batch will arrive end of September, uh, which was probably too pessimistic. I think uh, you can buy them again today. Uh, but you know, they sell. There is a thriving community behind the Raspberry Pi 4. A lot of the success is given by the community. Keep that in mind. And the community is using, well, whatever stock software was, was installed when they bought it. Um, and last but not least, uh, if, you, if we talk about upstream code, third parties take care of that, including SUSE. Yeah? Um, and that happens despite little support by the vendor. Means like, all right, what would be the motivation to change anything on such a successful model? 
um, interesting point. Uh, the, the, the Pi 4 is, or well, Raspberry Pi in general, is very successful, um, unlike uh, more open alternatives. There are such, like, uh, like Olimax makes this uh, old Linux Sino, which probably no one of you know, ha have ever heard of, right? Okay, okay, that one guy is d different. I, I, okay, a few have heard about it. Uh, but compared with Raspberry Pi, it's unknown. So, okay, that's one reason. And now if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, the issue from a software vendor perspective, means our perspective, software alone is useless. I mean, if you sell an operating system, you, you need hardware that can run it. Um, well, you need some hardware on day one because, again, you would not be able to sell software that does not run anywhere. Um, but if your software is open source, like ours is, then you must develop in public. I mean, that's this uh, upstream first. And we know we, we do that for a good reason. Um, we have little motivation to change because SLI is a successful business again. Like, uh, we're now the world's largest independent open source company. Um, no, I said open source, it should be Linux. Um, sorry, <laughs> that probably doesn't hold. Um, we have a rich global ecosystem of partners and that includes independent hardware vendors. Uh, unfortunately, not the, not the foundation, but okay, we, we have some relations, but uh, it's not the kind, yeah, that's, it, it's not on the level that we would like it to be. Um, but one more thing that makes it complicated is uh, we try to get this one size fits all. Uh, we want to create one product that can install anywhere and we save big money on just reusing the same code base for so many different platforms, devices, and so on and so on. Obviously, we, we will have to deal with the, the differences at some point, but you know, like we have one product, it runs on a very wide range of hardware, starting with a really small Raspberry Pi and ending with a mainframe. Um, uh, yeah, why would be, why, why would we, make a specialized operating system for the Raspberry Pi. I mean, it just, it's so unimportant from a business perspective. So we have little motivation to change. That's one reason the collaboration is difficult. Now, <clears throat> I'll get to the, um, to the technical reasons because there are also some technical reasons um, why it's difficult for us and there are a few, so I'll start with the first uh, chapter, which is bootloader. Uh, we do the bootloader differently than, uh, than downstream. So this is the officially supported method. Um, the Raspberry Pi starts in the, on the VPU, uh, which runs something called firmware. Uh, there is not much information about what exactly it is. Uh, like it is, um, it is based on RTOS, uh, but yeah, and like, it's closed source, which is not really different from many other machines. You, you rarely get uh, the source code of the firmware unless you're running that uh, Olimax thing again. <laughs> um, right, so it, it, it reads a config TXT, it, 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 it uh, makes a device tree, passes that device tree to a kernel that is also loaded from the VPU, and uh, it can also load the init RD. Um, there you go. Uh, start up. The, very easy. Uh, there are some limitations, obviously. And like uh, this, this small asterisk means uh, the firmware can only load from a fat partition. Um, yeah, so it, we can't possibly support this model. So that would mean uh, slash boot would have to be on a fat partition. I'm, I, I don't really dare to imagine what all could break by doing that way. Whatever. So we do it differently. We do it like uh, we do it on, on many other uh, platforms. We insert something in the middle. Um, I can go back and forth for, for a moment. So like, yeah, like, as you can see, the right side is pretty much the same. 
um, but there's something in the middle inserted. And <clears throat> so we let the firmware load uh, U-boot instead of the kernel. Uh, we also get the device tree from, from the firmware. Uh, that's not the only option. I mean, we could also pack uh, Raspberry Pi specific device tree inside U-boot um, or even in, inside the kernel, but we are not doing that. We, we just pass whatever data is available from the firmware down uh, to U-boot. U-boot then loads Grub. And you know, like it's it's like in mathematics. Now you have translated it to a standard standard architecture, like anything else that that we support with OpenSUSE or or, or SLE. Um, right. Um, this improves the the flexibility because uh, these loads no longer have the asterisk. So you can have your kernel on, a, on, a, on an X4 partition or a butter file system uh, or whatever else you prefer to have your boot partition on. Um, Grub, yeah, okay, supports a subset of, of, the, of the file systems understood by, by, by Linux, but I mean, that, this, is, this is a limitation of the operating system that we all already advertise. That's not a big deal. Um, there is a small catch here. Uh, U-boot does not support all file systems that Grub can support. So there is a little glitch here. But um, in practice, it, it does not really matter because we are using, a, um, we are using an EFI uh, module in U-boot, which means uh, Grub will have to be installed on a UEFI partition anyway. So. This load is not critical. This one is then arbitrary. So it gives some, some advantages, but yeah, you know, like this part is not supported by the foundation. If it breaks, they don't really care. Um, it is not completely true, they do care, but it has lower priority for them. <sighs> okay, now, Right, so that's, since it's not supported by the foundation, you will not find it pre-installed, which means we have to ship uh, the bootloader. Uh, this is very special. We don't do that for any other platform, at least not with SLE. Yeah? Uh, even if they boot with U-boot, then we rely on the U-boot that is pre-installed by the vendor, like uh, the NX NXP boards. Uh, which has some issues of, the, of its own because uh, sometimes the U-boot is not uh, really up to date and, and uh, it's difficult, but, but whatever. Like we don't, it, it's not our responsibility, but on the Raspberry Pi suddenly it is. Um, which also means when there is a new firmware version, the foundation does not test whether it still works with U-boot, it may break. And then it's, again, our responsibility to update U-Boot to work with the new firmware version. And yes, it does break sometimes. <laughs> um, they changed something in the, in the mailbox protocol, so U-Boot was hanging. Right. Um, there is another issue. I have already mentioned that we, we, we create a UEFI partition. Um, that's needed because, yeah, that's how we, how we decided to chain, load, U-boot, grub, and kernel. And UFI, as you probably know, requires GPT partitions. Um, and the firmware does not understand GPT partitions. It only understands legacy partitions, which means we have to create a hybrid MBR, which is ugly, as every one of you probably know. It's, yeah, it's ugly. And it, it has some dangers. Even you, you may, you may, if you if you happen to use um, some software that does not understand uh, MBR as well as legacy partitions, you can create inconsistencies. Okay, there is something. Can you get, get a microphone? I believe we stopped using the hybrid uh, MBR and you're using just an actual MBR. 
Okay. That sounds a bit better, but I would still be okay. But but then we then we break the UFI standard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, UFI firmware can handle MVR partitions because it's only require uh, a factor two partition that has a UFI slash boot is a and the OS loader. So it's Okay, thanks. So it's, it's it's not really a big issue, but still, uh, we have to keep in mind that we are limited by something that we have no influence over. Um, for example, okay, okay, for the Raspberry Pi, we will not hit the limits of MBR. <laughs> so yeah, okay, maybe. Well, and last not last but not least, hopping through three bootloaders takes longer than just loading the kernel directly. Uh, I think uh, Nicolas uh, mentioned that during development that just booting directly from the firmware is much faster. Um, maybe we can improve on that one. Good, so much for booting. Now we're getting to the third can of worms, which is the kernel. Um, so. The thing is, uh, as, I, as, as I have kind of said already, uh, the Raspberry Pi kernel is a downstream kernel. Um, they continually rebase it on new kernel releases. Uh, they're not uh, really much behind, so that's not a big issue. And yeah, we use the upstream kernel. Well, sometimes we enable, uh, we, we allow for some work in progress patches, so it means patches that are not yet upstream, uh, but we can't afford to add a patch that's not uh, acceptable by upstream community. So we are, yeah, the more limited in that way. Um, what that means, uh, the, 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 the official kernel has full support for all models and all peripherals, and they, they somehow made it work. Um, for, for the upstream kernel, we are missing features even after many, many years. We still do not have, we, we still, still do not have full support of the Raspberry Pi 3, and we are only struggling to get some basic support for the Pi 4. So that gives you an idea. Now the Pi kernel is developed out of the foundation, okay? This is developed by the community, which is actually better. Um, the authors of the Pi kernel have full documentation, I hope. Now, they have never actually confirmed that there is any documentation. So, um, you know, sometimes in, in companies that have hardware teams and software teams, the information only flows uh, by means of questions and answers, and there is no document describing what it actually does. So. Um, but maybe they have it. If there is any documentation, they have it. They definitely have m more documentation than we have. Um, and we, ha we, 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 ha we often have to guess. We just there is not enough detail. You can ask the foundation. They even answer, uh, not always, but very often they do answer. Uh, but still, there is a lot of things that are not clear enough, and we would need too much time to get them clarified. Um, Right, now, uh, on the downside, uh, the Pi kernel uses obsolete in-kernel API. So if you, if you look at the rebase uh, at, at the downstream kernel and the master branch, no, actually it's not called master, it's called something based on the, on the, on the latest upstream release. One of the few first few comments uh, that you'll find reintroduce APIs that were deprecated in the upstream kernel. Uh, one, more, one more reason we can't really follow that. Um, the thing is, if, if we get something into upstream, then the bonus is if the API changes, the community will take care of it. Okay, so at least something. Uh, now, the, the Pi kernel is updated irregularly when they see fit. <laughs> uh, the SUSE kernel is fully maintained, as you all know. Uh, this, okay, yeah, and not only is it, is it outdated, so it has some security holes, uh, they even have some user space APIs that are, that are insecure by design. I'll get to that later. Um, whereas the SUSE kernel 
has security in mind. Uh, now, the, the Pi kernel is still stuck with 32-bit only. It is possible to rebuild it as a 64-bit kernel, but that's, again, unsupported by the, by the foundation with all the caveats. You can do it. You can experiment it. It works. Mind you, it works. We have 64-bit, and OpenSUSE still has 32-bit as well. So, I mean, we have more flexibility. Um, and last but most importantly, uh, the Pi kernel is used by most Raspberry Pi users. And this kernel, I don't know if it's even used by anyone. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. No, I'm, I'm joking. I, we even have customers who use it. Um, but I mean, when talking about the OpenSUSE kernel, it probably has very, very few users. So if something is different, then it's always our fault, because the community is used to this. Um, right. What can we do? Yeah. Uh, because of that missing documentation, and I mean, uh, documentation is missing on both fronts. On the hardware itself, so we don't know what IP blocks are, uh, are even contained in, in the Broadcom SOC. Uh, during my research, I have, uh, I have discovered a few that were not mentioned anywhere, like a video coding engine. And yeah, like there was a very small, when I knew that, I, that, that there might be such a thing, uh, I, I used the search engine and I found uh, one sentence that suggested that indeed there is one. <laughs> so yeah, like we don't know what's, what's inside and if, even if we know what is inside, we don't know how to use it because the, the hardware registers are often undocumented. Um, so that's one part, and the second part is, uh, okay, if we, if we have to rely on the firmware, the firmware exposes some APIs, which are again not documented very well. Yeah, okay. So we can't maintain Raspberry Pi specific drivers. We simply do not have the, the, the knowledge. Um, well, on the good side, uh, Broadcom, contributes drivers for, for some of these IP blocks because they also use them in different, uh, in, in um, other chips uh, that may need a Linux driver. So, I mean, yeah, after all, why would we reverse engineer a driver if Broadcom will, at some point, hopefully, provide one? Um, but we can help with the generic kernel infrastructure. Uh, means like those, those things that benefit everyone but a single vendor usually does not have the motivation or, well, yeah, to, to work on it and invest uh, in, in improving it. That's why we see so many hacks in, in Arch code and in drivers. It's written by people who don't really have the motivation to do it in a clean way. But for us, if we help with making it in a clean way, uh, it pays off over a long time. Uh, it's already happening, actually, yes. Um, Nicolas was contacted by Flavio if, if they could co coordinate uh, the, the PCIe driver on the Raspberry Pi 4. Good. So much for the kernel. I still have a few minutes left, uh, so let me, let me mention user space. <laughs> Raspberry Pi has its own user space utilities. Uh, the binaries can be found here. Uh, most of them even have sources that can be found here. Uh, some binaries uh, do not have any sources, or well, have sources but not opened. Uh, allegedly due to licensing uh, restrictions, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Uh, whatever. Uh, means even if we wanted, we, we probably can't even redistribute them. I don't know, maybe redistribution would be okay, but we don't, well, we are not thrilled about redistributing binary crap. Um, more importantly, even if we could, many of, these, many of these utilities would not work with the upstream kernel. Um, for example, there is a device which, which gives you direct access to the video core APIs, I mean, the firmware APIs, 
and we don't have the driver for that because it's not in upstream and it does not look like it will make it in upst into upstream in any foreseeable future, not even staging. Um, and other utilities will not work with SUSE kernels. They might theoretically work with an upstream kernel, but not with a SUSE kernel, uh, because they try to access the hardware register through devmem, and we don't en enable that for good reasons. Right. <laughs> so much for the user space. So it means people who are used to, s to some of those utilities um, will have no chance to find them in a, in a, in a SLE or open SUSE distribution. Okay, and last, okay, I'll, I'll, may, I'll go quickly through that one, is installation. Like, uh, it's, it's really, th th this is generic. Uh, it's, it's the PC world versus the embedded world. Uh, on a PC, uh, you install by booting from, um, from an alternative medium like DVD or network or whatever, and you only distribute the installation ISOs and you have one universal ISO that everyone can use. In the embedded world, um, you rarely do that. Uh, instead, you prepare an image that is uh, written to a medium that can then be exchanged or is, is, uh, is transferred through a special uh, interface, and you just install for that given device from a different device. That's something that we could probably can't solve. Um, uh, second thing is, um, if, you, if you're a Raspberry Pi user, you probably heard about noobs. Uh, that's the standard way to install an operating system on a Raspberry. Uh, our images are not compatible. Uh, and I think that can be improved. So that's not a, that's not a problem we can't solve, but th that's one that we haven't solved yet and makes it also difficult for new users to try it out because it does not work with the most popular uh, operating system image manager. All right. To give you a summary, um, the SLE on Raspberry Pi is incompatible with the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, it's always lagging behind Raspbian in terms of features. Now on the positive side, um, it's a full-featured enterprise-grade 64-bit operating system. Uh, okay, so it's secure. Well, I mean, that's what it means, enterprise-grade. It's secure. It's certified. I don't know if, it, if, if the certification is valid on the Raspberry Pi, but whatever. Um, qa We do have Raspberry Pis in QA. And maintained. I don't know if we really want to maintain it for 10 plus years on the Raspberry, but whatever. Like, theoretically, we can. If there are customers, we will. And it's our own, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Obviously. The installer actually works in Raspberry Pi, and that's the only way to install with uh, encrypted, encrypted file system or stuff like that. Indeed. Indeed. I, I mean, I, I probably missed a lot of features that could be listed here. Um, so. Who would use SLES on Raspberry Pi? Well, surprisingly, there are already users, so, but there are people who do not use it but uh, are interested, like automotive um, uh, or digital signage. Digital signage might be even possible with a Pi 4, and many more might be interested. So it's, 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 not, really, it's not really hopeless. Uh, good. So, um, we have something like one minute for questions. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. So I thought I thought um, we were getting out of time. Good. Um, so yeah, then then we can we, we can have some discussion about uh, the things that I have mentioned. I also have some slides that I thought would never make it. Maybe. If you're interested, I can okay. I can give you some background why so many things on the Raspberry Pi look so weird. Um, okay, um, so when you when you think about the Broadcom sock design, uh, it was originally intended for consumer electronics like set-top boxes, video players, uh, stuff like that, and uh, Broadcom wanted to install a single-purpose application on the VPU, so they added a VPU that was capable enough uh, to run an, uh, an RTOS-style application. Um, 
VPU is a video processing unit. But it's, it's a kind of CPU. I mean... Right, exactly. Because you, you only have the peripherals that the most important part of it, like HDMI output uh, or uh, yeah, decoding engine. Or, you know, and you only need a, a real easy, simple uh, CPU-like unit that can control them, uh, implement the business logic, so to say, uh, when you, when you uh, like decode, uh, remote uh, infrared signals and, and act on them. So, yeah, so user interaction, exactly. So this was sufficient. And that's what the 2708 was. Um, now, when, um, when Raspberry Pi people uh, arrived, which was originally a group inside Broadcom, yeah, they, 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 they had a history. I believe Broadcom just wanted to try out what happens if engineers can do whatever they wish. And um, what they came up was, with was um, they, added, uh, they added one more peripheral, an ARM core. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and th the result would be called 2835 or uh, 37, like the, the different generations. So th these would be the base, uh, base modules, like 2835, which was the, the Raspberry Pi 1, was based on 2708. Um, the 2836 was based on 2709, and so on. Now, there's a difference with the latest one. I'll get to that or maybe I can, um, with the latest one, uh, even Broadcom uh, thought, okay, ARM core is a cool peripheral, let's put it in the base. Uh, so <laughs> that's why they didn't need anything special, J just 2711 already had everything. Uh, there, will, there will be zero delta between the, the 2711 and uh, th hypothetical 2838. Uh, you can, but you can still find 2838 sometimes, but it does not exist. In the end, it does not. Um, right. And if you have such design, then it makes sense uh, to, you, to do it like this. Like, you have a firmware, and you impl which is at the top of things, and uh, if there is something that can easily be done on an ARM core, you know, like some tasks can be easily done by an HDMI uh, output uh, engine, and, and, and some can be done on an ARM core. So um, you provide some interface, and uh, yeah, maybe a Linux kernel, maybe a different kernel. I mean, just why not? Um, the thing is, <sighs> Raspberry Pi did it slightly differently. Uh, so they didn't want to just be um, a slave uh, to this uh, firmware. Uh, they wanted to pretend that the Raspbian kernel is, is the master of the device. And for that, uh, this was sometimes, you, you know, like if, if we go back and if, if you need something from a different peripheral, you can only ask the firmware, please, would you do this for me and get, give me the results. And uh, in many cases, that was, that was too much overhead. So they wrote some drivers for the Linux kernel itself, uh, and, uh, which, which means that it can talk to some peripherals, and at the same time, the firmware can talk to the same peripherals. Uh, you see the, the issues, okay? <laughs> um, right. So uh, there is a kind of contract between the, the firmware and the Linux kernel, that the firmware will not touch certain peripherals that it might still touch if, if it wanted, uh, but it will not, just by coincidence. <laughs> um, and the, the kernel is free to use them. Uh, for other peripherals, where the firmware still wants to deal with things like temperature sensors and, and voltage sensors and, and, and stuff, uh, the kernel still has to ask the firmware and say, hey, you, um, I don't want to meddle with the registers because if we both try, uh, we may botch up. <laughs> so that's part of the, the story. Good. So now we have 10 minutes. Good. So um, uh, anyone 
has questions to anything that I showed, like, uh, right, maybe even, yeah, so I, I'll stop with the agenda. Um, or any, anything that you would like to add or ask about. Like, as you can see, it's difficult for us to develop for the Pi, for the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's not impossible. Uh, the use case is different. Um, we should also, uh, we should, uh, the, the message towards uh, customers and potential customers should also be uh, appropriate. Like, we should not be we should not be pretending that we can replace Raspbian. It's just a different operating system with different pros and cons. Um, right? Okay. Uh, do you have a microphone? I have a question about the bootloader. Why do why do you think the FET partition is so bad? You can have a separate part uh, partition just for the kernel, and uh, in it RD like we do for EFE on x86. Um, I don't really believe we do. Uh, we do the, we the kernel is not installed on the EFI partition. No, no, the kernel is not. But we copy them shim and grab and mock you okay. and or mock uh, manager. So the the, the uh, okay so so um, the suggestion is uh, we could uh, copy uh, kernel images and initrd images onto an additional partition. We could um, we lose uh, we lose quite a bit uh, because as you can see there is no grub in, in between here uh, so you would you would lose uh, features like booting from a snapshot and uh, many others. But yeah, I mean, okay. I think what the question was really going into is we make a distinction between slash boot slash VC and slash boot slash EFI. So it's not really about kernel and init RD, but rather about the EFI partition. And that one can in fact be separate from the bootloader firmware if you install via the ISO. It is not currently the case in um, the, um, in the, the SD card images because with MBR we are limited to four primary partitions and they are fully used um, by also having a swap partition. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, I get it now what the, what the question was. Okay. And if we still have some minutes, maybe you can go into some more details about limitations of Raspberry Pi 3 and status update on Raspberry Pi 4 maybe? Yeah, I can. Um, so, um, okay, uh, I think limitations refers uh, to, the, uh, to the digital signage uh, issue that I, or well, the use case that I mentioned. Um, uh, the thing is, okay, if I go to the very end, um, uh, as you can see, um, there is a there is a bus uh, that is that, that makes um, all peripherals and also all RAM available to both uh, the VPU and uh, the ARM cores. Uh, means essentially um, they are they are on uh, th th they share the memory, and this is an th this is an issue because one of these peripherals is the is the three D engine. <coughs> And uh, the 3D engine is, is uh, capable enough to read out your passwords <laughs> if you give it a, a good shader, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, so that means you can't you can't you, you can't enable uh, arbitrary uh, user space clients uh, to upload arbitrary shaders on the 3D engine. Uh, but that's how the DRM interface is designed. So you, 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 you can do ca computations or uh, yeah, use the 3D engine uh, from user space without any special, uh, any, any special uh, privileges. So, um, right. so what happens on the Pi 3 is to make it even possible to run, uh, run systems like Xorg, uh, the kernel verifies 
each shader that it's safe to be run for that process. Uh, and and that, that just kills performance. So uh, even if you try to do some digital signage, uh, the performance is so abysmal that it will not even yeah it, it will not be acceptable in practice. Uh, with the Pi 4, uh, it's it's better uh, because they finally added an MMU to the 3D engine, so you can actually limit uh, the the address spaces that are accessible by 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 this engine, and that also means. Um, you can improve the, the performance uh, a lot. That's why I was telling you uh, the, the digital, digital signage looks like it might even be possible. Um, this is not a problem if you don't need a general purpose uh, operating system here. So if, if, if you have a specialized application here and you can trust everyone who might, ac who might send a shader to the 3D engine, it's not an issue. So people are using uh, Pi 3s for digital signage, just not with a Linux operating system uh, or with a limit like with with the known limitation that it's not uh, secure against uh, like it does not provide process isolation yeah um, now the status of the pi 4 um, is it boots <laughs> Uh, we have been able to uh, resolve uh, issues around u-boot thanks to Matthias Brugger uh, it can load the kernel. Um, the kernel uh, can output something on the serial console. It can even use uh, the SD card reader. Uh, it cannot use um, the network, if I'm not mistaken. And it can't use the USB host controller. That's the, the, that's the most problematic part. That's because uh, the USB host controller is on a PCI Express uh, bus. Um, and it's a standard device, but, but we don't have drivers for the PCI Express bus. Uh, and that is, again, difficult uh, because of uh, issues with DMA. Uh, okay. <laughs> if you look here again, um, the, 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 the virtual address space of, uh, no, the physical address space of this uh, VPU is limited to one gigabyte because it's a 32-bit VPU and it uses the highest two bits for cache control. So you only have 30 bits of addresses. Means um, in, in the past, uh, it didn't make sense to enable, to, to make it possible to address more than one gigabyte. And many peripherals that are still in use um, on the latest and greatest 2711 still have the limitation. So if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, use a DMA buffer with these peripherals, you, you have to make sure that they fit into the first f uh, one gigabyte. And at the same time, the new peripherals uh, have been converted. So you can do DMA in uh, all four gigabytes that are available. Um, which kind of is not what, what the Linux kernel authors uh, anticipated back when DMA zones were invented. So, yeah, that's one of the things. Uh, another thing is the PCI Express driver. Uh, okay, the PCI Express IP block, uh, which is also used in other chips, uh, has a limit, has a very weird. Um, memory layout on on in, in some of these other chips. It's not an issue with the Raspberry Pi, but it's it it, it has a non-linear uh, view of memory, which again was never anticipated with uh, DMI infrastructure. Okay, but yeah, we still we still believe we can make it work uh, for SLI 15 SP2. <laughs> Maybe at least the DMA part. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the PCI Express can't address the highest one gigabyte. I mean, the the whole thing is limited uh, in and out. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? Rants. <laughs> Good. Then. Thank you. Oh, what? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you for your attention.
and enjoy your break. <laughs>